The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah. How many of y'all want to watch that after you get out of bed every morning? <laughs> I just want to show up before I preach every day. I remember about oh, six or seven years ago, I was um, invited to speak at a, a youth revival service, and it was at a, it was Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, and it was an all-black church, and, um, and I was invited to be their guest speaker, and, um, and I remember coming in that first night, and by the way, their, their revival services, their youth revival services were um, from infant to grandparents, and so all generations came out to their youth revival service, and the pastor, the youth pastor said, well, at this time, church, we're going to receive Pastor Josh tonight, and I didn't know what receive meant, and, and so he goes, would you please join me up here on the, on the platform? So I, I come up there, just have my Bible, my, my arm like a football, and and he goes, okay, church, now repeat after me. And I thought, oh, my Lord, what's going to happen? <laughs> and he goes, dear Jesus. And then the whole church, it's about 175 people in this church. They go, dear Jesus, preach. Or they said, we lift up Josh. We lift up Josh. Josh, preach the word. Preach the word. And they start chanting this prayer. And like, I felt I didn't do this physically, but on inside, I was like, oh, man. <laughs> Y'all don't even know what's coming. And, and that, that video does that same thing to me where I'm like, just give me a Bible and let me preach. And uh, I love it. But we have a risen Savior today. Can we say amen to that? 
I love the fact that we have a God that is not dead, but is very much alive in this world and alive in us. And um, it's not a statue or some figurine. We have a living God. And, and that's what we come to celebrate this morning. And so I, I meant to ask this question, why are we here? Why, why did you choose to come here this morning? Maybe it's because um, at your mom's or grandma's house, there's going to be an Easter egg hunt and some good food with some uh, glorified Buckeyes, which are really Easter egg, co- chocolate-covered peanut butter Easter eggs or something. That might be why you're here. Or maybe you're here for other reasons, but why are we here? We are either out of our mind celebrating the greatest scandal that has ever been pulled off in history, and for the last 2,000 plus years, people have pointlessly been gathering together on Sunday mornings to celebrate a madman, or we are here to celebrate the truth of the greatest event in history, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I would gather by the amens in here that We are all in here because of the latter. The resurrection of Jesus is is the greatest thing, the greatest event that has happened. It's the greatest thing that has taken place on the face of this earth, and it changed the trajectory for humankind. It changed their eternal trajectory. And we have the privilege, all of us who are sitting in here, and I'm sure there's a bunch who are sitting on the outside of this place, who know that God is the living God. And today we recognize that we have a risen Savior. And there's there's little that can top that, honestly. You take the greatest game that's ever been played, you you take the greatest event, and it, it doesn't even hold a light to what we get to celebrate, which is new life in Christ because of His resurrection from the grave. Before we get in too far, I want to pray. That way I don't fumble all over my words. And, and I want to make sure that as we read the word, that, that our hearts and minds are attuned to him. And so let's just join in prayer real quick. Jesus, we love you today. And we thank you that we can come in here and we, we have a God that is very much alive. All throughout Psalm, there, David and the other authors would talk about how you would bend your ear to their voice Well, you you can't do that if you're dead. And so, Lord, we love the fact that you are alive, that you hear us this morning, that our praise is a blessing to you, that our life lived to you in, in a way that honors you, Lord, that blesses you. And so today we come in and we recognize that we have a living God that we live for. And we want to say thank you for being alive in us. And so, Jesus, as we open up your word, I pray that as we as we read it, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would just pierce our hearts with truth. That we would know you better within the next 30 minutes. That we would know you more closely and more clearly. And may we walk out with more vigor, with more excitement, with more anticipation to live for you than we did when we walked in. We ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. And if you agree with that prayer, shout amen. Amen, amen. amen, amen. Well, we're going to look at some, some stuff um, from an angel this morning. We're going to look at some very basic words that were spoken by an angel. Now, up to this point, this is, this is what has transpired. Last week, we talked about, we had the great help. If you weren't here, we had Fred the donkey usher in Jesus. And um, it wasn't a real donkey. It was just on a TV cart, and he looked really good, though. Um, but, but Jesus comes in on the triumphal entry, and, and it we see it was very public, and, um, and it was purposeful of him coming into Jerusalem as the triumphant king. And um, between then and now, Jesus has spent a great deal of time with people, um, with his disciples, with Pharisees who were trying to pin him and, and catch him in, in different lies and whatnot. Since, since we last met, uh, just a few days ago, Jesus would have been handed over to authorities. He would have been beaten. He would have had a crown of thorns pressed on his head. He would have been um, flogged. He would have carried a cross to a place called Golgotha, and he would have been hung up on the cross, pinned up on a cross. He died. A man by the name of Joseph from Arimathea, who was a wealthy man, 
Um, he, he was so wealthy, in fact, that um, the, really the, the most wealthy, their burial preparations were stone that would be hollowed out, and so their tomb would be hollowed, and a hollowed out stone. And, um, and he was gracious enough and generous enough to not only offer that to Jesus, but he prepared the body of Jesus to be ready to be put in the tomb. Mary of Magdalene and Mary, who is James and Joseph's uh, mother, they watched as Jesus' body is placed in this tomb. The tomb was sealed. And we have these religious leaders who were overly cautious, and they remember these murmurings, and they remember hearing Jesus say something to the effect of raising on the third day. Some absurd statements like that. And so just for good measure, they bring some uh, city officials and they reopen the tomb and they verify that it is Jesus and then they reseal the tomb and then they put a seal on it saying this has been verified that Jesus is in here. And that's where we pick up today. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to read through um, and look at some very simple statements. But I think that some of the most powerful statements are the ones that are the most simple. So we're going to pick up at the very beginning of chapter 28 and, um, and just follow along as I read this. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Now, the presence of an angel alone was enough to cause a violent earthquake. And we go on to watch this or read this, that um, his appearance, the angel's appearance was like lightning. I don't know if any of you are enamored by storms and, and thunderstorms. I used to love it as a kid. I think, I think the Midwest has the best storms. Um, where I'm from in Indiana, we used to be able to watch five different storms at one time because the land was so flat. And, and I, I remember in my more um, testing God days, I remember running around on a golf course with a golf club <laughs> during a storm. I just thought that I might be able to trek, attract some awesome lightning. It never happened. So just want to let you know, kids don't ever do that. Um, but lightning is powerful. And this angel had the, the appearance of lightning. I can only fathom what that would be like. I wonder if it stayed that way. I wonder if the angel stayed as lightning is. That would be an, crazy intense. The guards were so afraid that they shook and became like dead men. In other words, they had a seizure and passed out. They couldn't handle the presence of, of ho the holiness. They couldn't handle the presence of what was before them, and they literally shook themselves to the point of passing out. I'm pretty sure that mine would have been probably the same. Then the women, they're still standing there, and the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus. And just to be clear, because Jesus is a popular name then, just to be clear of the Jesus that you're looking for, it's the Jesus that was just crucified. That's, that's the guy that you're looking for. Don't be afraid. Listen to this. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly, tell his disciples, tell, tell the disciples this, that he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you, drop the microphone, turn her away. Boom, there's the message, peace out. We're going to look at the simple statements of the angel. There's four things. It's, we're going to break it down into four pieces. Very simple statements, but they mean so much for us today. And listen, it is truth. What we're reading today is truth. Just to catch everybody up to speed, what we hold in our hand right here has stood the test of time. Amen. We don't, I don't know what it is about our day and age that we, we live in, but we think that our opinion 
outweighs the truth that is written here. We, we think that we have the audacity to have an opinion of whether or not this is true. Listen, it's what else has been around for thousands of years but the truth of Christ? What else has been around for thousands of years but the word of God? I mean, it's, it's self-fulfilling. The Bible even says that the word will last and endure forever. So what we are reading here is truth. Um, so here, we're going to break it down, all right? The first piece of this. Again, I'm going to remind you, this is, these are really simple, but so profound for us today. He is not here. This picture that we have up there, I don't know if that's, that's probably kind of like what it was. He's not there. Now, it's important for us to understand, well, who is he? Who's the he that he's talking about? Who's the he that the angel's talking about? The he is Jesus. And it's the Jesus, not the normal, average Jesus, but Jesus, the son of God Jesus. That's the one that's no longer in this tomb. If it were anybody else, their dead body would still be there. Now remember, we just saw these city officials who didn't really care much for Jesus. We have these Pharisees and religious leaders who didn't care much for Jesus, and they verified, were going to the tomb that was verified, had a stamp on it by, by the Roman authorities that there he is. He's there. Right there. That's, he's there. But now we're with the angel, with these two women, and he's not there. He, Jesus, who was just crucified, he's not there. Now not, I didn't think there'd be a lot of things that would come up with the word not, but when you look up the Greek meaning of not, it means absolute negative. Ain't no way, ain't gonna happen, no way, uh uh-uh, no how, no way. There's none none of that, add all that together, that's Jesus in the tomb, he's not there. He's not There's no other way to slice it. He's he's just not there. And where's there? There's the tomb. He's not in the tomb that he was just placed. And I know I'm being repetitive with this, but, but it's important for us to understand that our living God, he's not in a tomb. He's he's not in a fixated place. He's alive. And what I love about this is that when we acknowledge the fact that he's not in this tomb, but he's alive. And when we acknowledge this, he, he becomes alive in us. I said, it's crazy. You hang around me long enough, you'll understand that the only reason that there's any good that comes in my life is because Jesus Christ is in me. And I know that to be true because I know me. And I know me without Christ. Just a big ball of dirt that doesn't know any better about a lot of things, but I have the help of Jesus that helps me understand what it looks like to love, that l- helps me understand what it looks like to be gracious. We have a very much alive Jesus. Now that brings us to the second point. So he is not here. He, the same he that we were just talking about, that he, he is risen. That's the second slice of this. He is risen. To be risen, it means to recall dead, to recall the dead to life. And I wonder how many of us in here this morning that that message has become common or or familiar to you. That he has risen. Is it something that you yawn at now? Yeah, I know he's alive. I've heard it. Yawn. Big deal. Has it become boring to you? the most profound thing that could ever have happened on the face of this earth, has that become common to you and boring? Man, I hope that this morning that there's something that just kind of cracks or breaks or chips away at you that that helps you enter into that reality as if it was the first time that you heard it because it doesn't make sense to the natural mind. Now, we know that Lazarus was just raised. I mean, before all of this happened with Jesus, Jesus called forth to Lazarus and raised him up. Well, why wasn't Lazarus' resurrection any more special than Jesus? Because Jesus was perfect. He was the Son of God. 
He healed the sick. He, he, he healed the lame. He, he's the one that was of a virgin birth. That's the difference. See, the resurrection of Jesus is not something that's boring. I actually sat down last, or I don't know when it was, a few nights ago, and I wrote down things that are boring. Watching paint dry is boring. How many of you have ever done that? Anybody watch paint dry? It's fascinating. I think it's changing colors. It's getting darker. Driving through Kansas is boring. If you haven't done it, don't. <laughs> Buy a plane ticket. <laughs> Funny story, when Summer and I first got married, we were driving, our honeymoon consisted of driving across country in a U-Haul, pulling our car behind us. That was fun. And um, <clears throat> we were, this is before we had smartphones, and so we had maps, and so Summer's looking ahead at the states that we'd be driving through, and so she's like reading, you know, Tennessee, and da-da-da-da-da, and she goes... That's a dumb state name. I was like, what? She goes, Arkansas? <laughs> really? Arkansas? And I, I'm driving and I just... <laughs> I, I, ju I just said I do to, to, to Arkansas. <laughs> I just... Oh, my Lord. So then I said, it's, um, it's Arkansas. And she goes, oh! <laughs> Watching national chess competitions is boring. Watching televised bowling is boring. Sorry if that offends anybody, it's just straight up boring. <laughs> Working at a toll booth, I would imagine, would be boring. And because I had the experience of doing this, working a Charles Schwab convention is boring. Trust me. If you've been to it and you loved it, I don't mean to be offensive. It's just not my cup of tea. The fact that Jesus is risen is not a boring concept. Or it's not a boring thing to think about. Listen, a dead man who was the son of God was crucified, put into a tomb, and now he's alive. It's fascinating. Sit and think about it for a little bit. And I guarantee you, your thoughts will not be bored thoughts. How can that be? What does that mean? That doesn't make sense. And I, I, I was doing this earlier too. Think about this. The one, this is what the Bible says about Jesus, that everything that we see was created through him. So at the beginning of time, before time existed, we're, we're, this is the kind of authority and power that we're talking about. That, that guy, that being in which everything that came to be was done through, he now was there in that. It does not register. The fact that he was, that the plan and the, the route for God to reach, to, to reach us was by sending his own son makes no sense. And then, the fact that he was crucified and he died and now he's alive, that should rattle your brain for the rest of your life. Now it goes on to say this, the angel goes on to say this, he's not here, he has risen just as he said. You can count on it because the Son of God said so. Well, what, what, what difference does that make, the Son of God says so? Well, he's the Son of God. That's why it matters. He, he, he was perfect. There's no lie that could come of him. Actually, because he, he resembled, he was the very character and nature of God, he could not lie. That's why that means something. Jesus said so. We have three different accounts when he's just hanging out with the disciples, and I'm sure that was a real wet blanket to the conversation. They're all probably tearing bread and eating fish and everything, and then he's just casually, hey guys, just so you know, when I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be handed over to the authorities, I'm going to be beaten and flogged, and I'm going to die. But then three days later, I'm going to raise again, and they're probably like eating their food like, good party. 
And three times he does this. He does it at a really pivotal time for the disciples when they come to realization that he is the Christ, he is the Messiah. When, when that res- resonates in their head, right after that he goes, now listen, now that you have that truth in your head that I am he that the prophets wrote about, you need to know this, that, that I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. But y'all just hold on. Three days, I'm, I'm going to raise again. I'll be alive. He said so. And this is probably the most um, compassionate part of what we have to read here from this angel. He's not here. He's risen because, remember, he said he, he would do all of this. Now, listen to how sweet this is that the angel says to these two women. Come and see. It's a, the, 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 the Greek of this, the word come is a gentle, kind, sincere extension of, it's, it's this kind invit- invitation It was, it was literally, it says, come hither. Now, we don't talk like that today because we're, we're not that proper today. Come, come, come here. Come on, I, you, you need to see this. And you need to see this not only with your eyes, but you need to see this with your mind. You need, you need to perceive what's, what, what has taken place. Come on, come on. Actually, the tomb's over here, so come on. I, I want you to see this empty tomb. And is that not the heart of God to, to not only just rest in what Jesus has said and not only rest of what the word of God says, but even today, even right now, we have a God who would say, come on, you need, to, you need to see this empty tomb. We don't, we don't worship a, a, a figurine. We don't worship some object. We worship a not dead God. We, we worship a living God, one who defeated death, one who conquered sin, one who gives new life and new hope, new purpose, new meaning. That's the God we live for. And that's the only God that can do what is exemplified on that PowerPoint right there. That's the only one. And throughout the ages, men have tried to fabricate these other false gods and whatnot, they, they can't do what he's, he's already done. 